We've been talking about the way water gets to streams, what we call stream flow generation mechanisms. So when it rains on the landscape, most of the rain falls on the ground, not right in the stream channel. And somehow we've got to get it from the solid ground into the stream channel. In this video, we are going to talk about saturation over land flow. And this idea of saturation over land flow is very much related to uh, the concept of variable source areas that contribute to stream flow. So we'll talk about that in this video as well. In the simplest term, saturation over land flow is what you get when you have prolonged rainfall or snow melt that brings the water table up to the land surface. And when it's saturated all the way up to the land surface, then the only place for water to go is over the land downslope and eventually to the stream. So that's the nuts and bolts of saturation over land flow. So let's look at it in cartoon form. So to start saturation over land flow, we actually have to have rainfall infiltrating into the ground, coming down to a water table here into the saturated zone, and then uh, flowing downslope in that saturated zone as subsurface flow. Now this can be subsurface storm flow that I talked about in a previous video, which I hope you've watched, or it can be sort of your general all-purpose uh, regional water table and groundwater flow. But in any case, we have a water table here developing during the storm. And as more rain falls and infiltrates and percolates downwards, that water table is raised up so that eventually that water table starts to intersect the surface. And instead of getting your uh, subsurface flow going directly into the stream, it emerges onto the ground, onto the saturated ground, and then proceeds over land. So this red arrow here is really our saturation over land flow in this diagram. And since this is water that has fallen from the sky, infiltrated, percolated, moved through the subsurface, and is now returning to the surface to be saturation over land flow, we call this flow return flow. The other thing that happens is that if you've got return flow going on, you've got saturation overland flow going on, and it's still raining, uh, any rain that falls on that saturated area can't infiltrate, and so it uh, becomes a direct runoff into the stream via overland flow. So there are really two processes that come together uh, that we call saturation overland flow, and that's this return flow that again has been subsurface flow and is now returning to the surface, and then the direct precipitation on the saturated area. So that never goes underground, it always stays on the surface and quickly enters the stream. So I wanna thank uh, Todd Walter for some great animations here that describe this process. So in the simplest view, uh, we have a water table below the land surface. Again, um, tend to have a higher elevation of the water table in upslope areas and a lower elevation as you get down into the valley and the stream. So the precipitation is falling and it's infiltrating. And as precipitation continues, that water table rises, it intersects the land surface, and it's this area here now that is the saturated area and where we have saturated overland flow occurring. Um, in that past diagram, I didn't have any contrasts in the subsurface, uh, but in this cartoon, we've illustrated uh, a, an area where there might be a contact. This could be bedrock, or this could be some sort of low permeability zone within the soil. So this is the classic setup for subsurface storm flow. Again, it starts with precipitation falling on the land surface, infiltrating, and then moving downslope. As the rainstorm continues, this saturated wedge builds up and up and up until it intersects the land surface. And here again, we have this zone of saturation over land flow. Note that uh, it looks pretty much the same as the previous set of animations. And in both cases, we're seeing the saturation and the saturated area reaching the land surface 
at the base of the hill slope, so relatively close to the stream channel. So any place where the water table is going to intersect the land surface, the base of the hill slope, or a place where lots of water is coming in all into the same location, like a hill slope hollow. These are the places where we see saturation over land flow. The longer the storm continues, the size of the saturated area increases. And then as uh, precipitation ceases, saturation over land flow can continue for some time, but decreases as that, um, that saturated wedge drains and eventually drops back below the land surface. All right, and so eventually we're back to just that subsurface storm flow or interflow slowly draining the hill slope. If you have a uh, complex topography, because of course real hill slopes aren't just a smooth boundary between soil and bedrock, that can set up more complicated patterns of saturation over land flow. So note um, that in this picture, we have an area of the hill slope where the bedrock is relatively close to the land surface. Here, the soils are deeper. And so as that saturated wedge builds up in the subsurface over the course of the storm, um, we end up with a area of saturation over land flow partway up the hill slope. So this would be sort of a, a seep or wet zone on the hill slope creating over land flow. Now it's saturated here, but down here it's not. So that overland flow may ultimately re-infiltrate here um, and then potentially emerge again downslope. So we can get sort of a, a loop-de-loop -loop here where we might have water that has uh, fallen on the landscape here, infiltrated, been subsurface storm flow, emerged as return flow, re-infiltrated, and re-emerged as return flow. But again, any precipitation that falls on these saturated zones will be directly uh, conveyed along the surface without ever infiltrating at all. So we have these two different processes mixing it up in saturation overland flow. And again, after the storm ends, uh, the water table will decline as it drains and our saturated areas disappear and then our subsurface storm flow uh, peters out. So I mentioned that bedrock topography under the soil can matter and the shape of the hill slope matters. So this is an illustration uh, showing an area of saturation developing in a place where flow is converging. So this you could think of as sort of the space between two hill slopes or that little valley head or hollow. Um, and notice that it's also more saturated by this stream channel here. So the places that we see saturation over land flow develop first are these concave slopes, so bowed in slopes, the hill slope hollows, um, the, the foot of the slope, and then in places with shallow soils. And unsurprisingly, saturation over land flow is much more common in humid regions, places with relatively low intensity rainfall, but prolonged rainfall or frequent rainstorms where you can really build up those subsurface water levels build up that water table until it reaches the land surface. As illustrated in the block diagrams, uh, the area that is saturated varies over time. And that's um, illustrated in map view in this series of pictures. So up here we have our stream network and then you can see these little sort of stippled areas at the head of each channel. Those are representing the saturated areas. This is under relatively dry conditions. And then uh, a rainstorm uh, happens, goes on, and the landscape starts to wet up. And what you actually see is an expansion of the uh, stream network and an expansion of these saturated areas, these stippled areas at the heads of the channel. And then finally, down at the bottom picture, it's still raining. It's been a really long rainstorm. And so even more of the landscape is wetted up. We have much more channel network developed. So these are uh, ephemeral channels or intermittent channels and we have a lot of saturation not only in the hollows at the heads of the channel but all along um, the valley bottoms along each of these channels here. Uh, so saturation over land flow is really dynamic in both space and time. It varies 
during the rainstorm as illustrated uh, by these three figures and also between storms. So if you have a short low intensity storm, you will have uh, much less of the landscape that gets saturated than in a really prolonged storm. Or if you have really dry conditions before the storm, you will have less saturation overland flow than if you have storm after storm after storm where the landscape's really not drying out between those rainstorms. Again, uh, the fancy term for what I just said is antecedent wetness. So how wet is the landscape prior to the start of the storm? And this idea of variability of how much of the landscape is getting saturated and contributing to saturation overland flow um, is related to the idea of the variable source area. So variable source area is the idea that um, most of the flow in the stream or that leaves a watershed is actually coming from a pretty small part of the watershed. So the tops of the hill slopes, the upper parts of the hill slopes, most of the time, there's really not a lot of direct connectivity between those upper drier areas and the stream. Instead, all of the action is driven by subsurface storm flow, the development of saturated wedge, and the development of um, overland flow. And so it's a variable source area because the places where those things are happening, the saturated wedge and the saturation and infiltration excess overland flow, all of that is varying between storms over the course of the storm and in, in terms of their relative importance through the storm and between storms. So we think of our watershed as the source of the stream, but really it's hot spots within the watershed that vary in space and time that are contributing the flow to the stream. And that's what this variable source area concept is talking about. And these variable source areas can include saturation overland flow. They can also include infiltration excess or Hortonian overland flow where that happens, as well as fast subsurface storm flow. So. We can have variable source areas that are not saturated, but are generating stream flow in other methods. This idea of the variable source area concept came out of work in the Southern Appalachians in the 1960s by Hewlett and Hibbert. This is how they illustrated it in one of their classic papers. So um, here you have a bunch of arrows uh, illustrating the uh, flow down the hill slope and what you can see is the length of the arrows increases as you move down the hill slope indicating that there's more flux of water in that lower part of the hill slope than there is in the upper part of the hill slope um, more with greater depth uh, in the in the soil profile and less in the upper part of the soil profile because the upper part of the soil profile is really dominated by vertical flow rather than lateral flow. And then over here, they've got um, a channel network and they talk about how ch the channel network expands as a storm goes on or during really wet conditions. This idea of the variable source area concept doesn't specifically invoke saturation over land flow. That was developed um, in 1970 by Dunn and Black working up here in Vermont at the Sleepers River watershed. So just like the work on subsurface storm flow often involves uh, making lots of measurements in the subsurface and maybe even trenching a hill slope, that's what Dunn and Black were able to do in um, their study area. And then they did a lot of boots on the ground and actually mapping where saturation occurs. So notice we have uh, some concave hill slope areas here and a hill slope hollow and their trenches ex um, extending over both planar and convex as well as concave hill slopes. So they could look at that spatial variability in the subsurface processes and the spatial variability in where saturation develops and uh, what they see in the Sleepers River watershed and, and in many watersheds is it's uh, these longer rainstorms, uh, rainstorms under wet conditions and snowmelt as illustrated here. So this is a, a, a photo of actual saturation overland flow happening in the Sleepers River watershed in Vermont where this idea was first conceptualized. <laughs>